We are live. <laughs> What's up, everybody? Welcome to another episode of Police Off the Cuff After Hours. I'm your host, Mark DeMeo, my co-host, my partner in all things law enforcement, the very handsome Bill Cannon. What's up, Bill? I'm looking forward to this. It was tough to get, Jim. I, you know, I got a hold of him a couple of months ago, then he went he went on the lam for a while. You know, he's then then I understand why. He's, he's down in Florida, Jupiter. living large. You know, he's he's down in Jupiter, Florida, living large. <laughs> he's got a, he's got a, a, a huge. He's out on dates every night. <laughs> the, the girls are diving into his car. I don't even know he's, what kind of car he has. You look very <laughs> sexy, my friend. He can have a military jeep. They'll still be diving in. You know. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, let's introduce our guest. He's a retired NYPD inspector. He was the commanding officer of the aviation unit. He's also a commercial pilot. Let's give a warm welcome to James Cohen. What's up? Hello, everybody. Lovely to be here. I'm honored. <laughs> it's a pleasure to have you. What are your days like now? You know, it's a, I, I got to tell you, you know, being retired, I don't know how I found the time to go to work. It's, <laughs> you, you're busy. Look at, that, look at that, Mark. Look at that in the background. That's what he's doing. He's, he's bringing kilos in from Columbia. <laughs> don't get too excited. I'm nothing more than a high-speed Uber driver. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> really, right? <laughs> that's got to be some interesting job, though. Is wow. that a, that's a private jet? It's a private jet. I got a couple of, you know, tier one, high end, very discreet uh, clients. They have their own planes to get around from go to A to B. And, uh, you know, I just fly for them. I don't do any charter work. I just take care of a couple of really good, good people that did very well. And when you uh, when you get to your destination, do you, where do they do you? Are you staying with them or are you heading back or what are you doing? Usually I head back because like like I'll give you an example. My guy today, he lives in my community. Great guy. So I flew him out about 10 days ago to his place in Steamboat. I parked the plane over in Centennial by Denver. And then I jumped on a commercial flight from Denver, came home to Florida. Yesterday, I flew out to Denver, went down to Centennial, checked on the plane, got a hotel this morning, got up, put my outfit on, went over to Hayden by Steamboat to pick him and his family up, flew him home to Stewart. He left, you know, right away, of course. I tied up, tidied up the plane, put it away. And then I was home probably 30 minutes behind him. And he lives three blocks away. That's wow. pretty cool. Yeah. The, um, I, I guess they like the uniform, right? They, when, you, when you come to pick them up, they like the uniform. Listen, they're signing the check. I'll wear a fucking dress if they want. <laughs> you, ever, you, ever think about, uh, you ever think about putting your department rack on there? Uh, yeah. <laughs> Maybe you get more jobs. You know, this guy's really, this guy's for real, man. Look at him. Well, <laughs> believe it or not, like, my clients are all pretty ultra conservative. I mean, they're hardworking people that earn what, what they got in, in life. And, and they're all pretty conservative. And we have some very interesting discussions. And they, and they, they know my background. Oh, that's great. That's great. I, I, I'd hire you too. Why not? <laughs> Jim, let me ask you something now. Yes, I, was always, I was always interested in this. And some people told me different that you, uh, aviation – either want you to have a little bit of flying experience or they don't want you to have any flying experience because they want to teach you their way. What's the truth? All right. So things were different before I got there. Um, I changed it around. I put a little more of a military flair on it. We want people that know how to fly. And that's still true to this day. They have to have a base of knowledge, something to work with. And then we kind of retrain them. Like even my military guys that, would, that I picked up, I put them through the whole training syllabus. You had to complete the syllabus. Now, what might have taken you six months to complete, a guy coming off from flying in the military might take him a month to go through the syllabus, but everybody has to complete the same syllabus so that we can train you or retrain you our way because flying around the city of New York in a law enforcement role, in a public service role, is, is a little bit different than flying in the military a little bit different than flying corporately. Um, so, yeah, they, yeah that, that was me up in that helicopter there. It was the first time, but it, I didn't get picked. They said they didn't, uh, like, they didn't like the way I dipped toward the Empire State Building, you know? So that's, that, was, <laughs> that was the Augusta 119 and the Bell 412. As soon as I took over, I looked at the maintenance record on the Augusta 119, and within two years, we got rid of all of them and replaced them with twin engine. Bell 429s. And I got to give Ray, Ke Ray Kelly credit on that because I went to him and did a briefing and my boss and everybody thought he's going to kill you. 
He listened to the briefing. I told him what it would cost. I told him how we could help with the financing by getting federal grant money, and he approved it. Wow. And what was the reason why you made the switch? All right, so before 2000, I got there 2010. Before 2012, the NYPD was flying around in single engine patrol helicopters. If there was an engine malfunction, if you're in Montana or Wyoming, no problem. You got plenty of real estate to land. Uh -huh. There's no open prairie in the Bronx, in Upper Manhattan, Lower Manhattan, Brooklyn. You're going into the side of a building. There's going to be a big fire. The litigation is going to be amazing. And it's going to cost the city a lot more money than if we just get rid of these singles and buy twins. And Ray had the wisdom to see that. Very good. Very good. Now, you, Jim, let's just talk a little bit about your police career. You... Um, First of all, you were in the military. You came, you were a lieutenant in, in the, what, the Air National Guard? Before I you came on? as a lieutenant colonel in the Army National Guard. But when you came on, you were a lieutenant, right? When I came on the job, I was a, I was a lieutenant in the uh, Army Reserve when I came on the job. Okay. So, yeah, you got that military thing. Like, even when you move, like when you grab your drink, you're like... <laughs> <laughs> It's very stiff. It's like the. <laughs> you, you have that. You know, it's funny when we had Joe Pistone on, who you know is the the real Donnie Brasco. Yeah. You know? We were saying we were saying how do you get rid of the copisms in your body language? Like, how do you learn to do that? Because we all have it. You know, I yeah. can spot you from ten miles away. Say so he was oh, a no, cop. No. You know, and he was like, well, you know, he he sort of explained it away. But I was like, you know, like because when we stand, we stand with our legs spread apart because we want to take the, the strain off our lower back from carrying a gun for so long, right? Yeah, I remember I'm riding the subway one day, and I'm just sitting there minding my own business. And some moke gets on. He's sizing up everybody on the train, and he makes eye contact with me. And, of course, I'm staring right back at him. Yeah. He can nod, and he says, uh, good afternoon, sir. No problem. I says, good. Go to the next car. <laughs> Well, they that is a trait of a cop. Off. A cop will return a mope stare, you know, where a yeah. civilian will look look the other way, you know. <laughs> yeah, that's definitely the way they find out. When you walk into a room, um, you're always looking around. Looking yeah. You know, who's, who's up to no good? And that's just a, a – a, that's your instinct as a cop. And you, you keep that with you. So when you make eye contact with somebody, you know, and they're a little shady – you, you stay looking at them where most people get scared and, and look away. You, you stay with that. But you could also have that as just being a New Yorker from the street. And that's what I think, um, you know, Joe Pistone had. It's, it's a very it's, – it's a tough thing to gauge when you're just a, a neighborhood tough guy because you look at people anyway. You look them right in the eye. Yeah. Turn away either. So it's a little – it's tough. You know, it's, a, it's, it's not that far away from being a cop and being a, just a tough guy. Because you don't back down and you don't break a stare. You can't. No. <laughs> no, Jim, let me ask you something. I know in your police career you were in five shootings. So when you went to the range, did they give you a couple extra boxes? <laughs> 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 Knowing that you laid down a lot of lead? <laughs> I, I, was, I was blessed, and I was extremely, extremely lucky. Extremely lucky. What? Well, you had your three medals of valor, right? Like I said, I was extremely lucky. The only guy I know who beat you is Mike Heinrichs. Oh, Mike the General. He's yeah, all the general, yeah. The general has uh, – he had two combat crosses and two medals of valor. And I believe, correct me if I'm wrong, he got two of those earned in the same night. I think they were taking him to the hospital after one shooting, and on the way he hears of a – 60, a robbery in progress, and he tells the guy driving him to the hospital, hey, that's two blocks away. Let's go on that. Ah. And he was sitting on the same night on his way to the hospital. <laughs> you know something? What a sweetheart of a guy, though. The nicest guy in the world. And you would never think that this is this superstar New York City cop. You'd look at him and say, he's probably a high school math teacher. You know? I'm, I'm <laughs> in awe. I, I, I know Mike very well. I'm in awe of Mike Heinrichs and his abilities to sit down and calmly talk to somebody that I couldn't get two words out of with a phone book for a half hour. And he engages the guy in conversation, comes out of the room in 10 minutes with a pad and says, yeah, he gave everything up. He's just, he has that ability. 
He does. He's amazing. He's one, uh, you know, he's one, he's one of the best of the best, and he's got the um, – you know, when, if you compare it to sports, you have a, like a record. You know, you got your stats. And he's at the top. If he was an athlete, he, whatever, playing baseball, he'd be the king. He'd be the, yeah. he'd be the GOAT. He's awesome. You so, know, uh, Jim, we've had some of the best uh, of the best on this show. Of course, the great Lieutenant Peter Pranzo of Harlem Raiders fame. He's in the house. He's <laughs> he's in the chat room with his wife, Richella. Tommy Kennedy, who's one of my Buddies, you know, one of my favorites. Oh, another amazing guy. A, a superstar, you know, Mike Heinrichs, uh, Barrett, I, Louis Anamon, you know, oh. we, have, we have, I can't even think of all the great uh, people. Uh, Walter Wazalewski, Medal of Valor page, you know. Walter is amazing. Yeah. How lucky are we to have worked with such guys like this? Yeah, and, uh, you know, how lucky are we to have interviewed all these guys, which is, uh, you know, I always say the greatest thing I like about doing this show is the great people I get to meet. And I really mean that, you know? Yeah, me too. I mean, that's why we we came up with this idea was it was to memorialize uh, these great cops, their stories. Because where do they go when you retire? They just kind of fade well, away. I got to ask you something. You guys, now that you're retired, you're working as professional comedians? Mark is more than me. I, I, I just started like six years ago. Mark's doing it like 25 years. I'm, I'm so involved in this podcast that I don't even know if I'm going to really have enough time to go back to comedy again, you know? It's just, it's, it's a lot of time. Mark gets booked every weekend, so. Well, you, you know, Bill and Mark, what people don't realize, they all see police shows and they think it's all cops and robbers, but what they don't realize is that a lot of what we dealt with yeah. was was comedy. Every <laughs> night, you know, the, cops are some of the funniest people on earth. They're <laughs> laughing so much at work. Yeah, that's yeah. true. It's you know there's a there's a, a certain guy that can get along in the neighborhoods. You know what I'm saying? Like because a lot of it is just um, street talk. You know, and I remember one time walking into a projects and and this guy was looking at me and he was like, he was ready to say something. So I was like, you need a haircut, my friend. And his friends started because uh, he had nappy. Uh, you know, his his naps were on top of naps. And he, <laughs> And then he goes to me, uh, he goes, shut up, Ricky Martin. <laughs> <laughs> That's a pretty damn good comeback, yeah, though. That know? was when we were walking in the door, and then all the guys that I was with started patting me on the back. And wouldn't you know it, that's like a relationship where you get, you know, you can actually start talking to somebody right now. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Because you you know the streets. It's not the end of the world if they say something to you. It's not hurting your feelings. You come back with something snappy. You know what I'm saying? Uh, that's how I built relationships anyway. Good stuff. So, Jim, what we used to say in street crime, and I'm sure you used to say it too, is that when you did a stop question and frisk, and it, it was a negative, you tried to leave them with a good taste in their mouth. <laughs> and not, I'm serious, like by saying, hey, buddy, sorry, man, someone, you fit the description of someone we were looking for with a gun, you know, that's our job, blah, blah, blah. You know, and you'd leave them instead of the cop that would say, hey, go kiss my ass, get out of here, you know what I mean? Yeah. You know, Dick Savage, who was like the father of street crime, Told me one night, he said, you know, anybody can stop a guy and have the guy go away angry. That's easy. He says, you stop a guy, you put him on the wall or you put him down on the ground. And when you're done, and if he's not the guy you're looking for, if you're shaking hands and he's thanking you when he left, he said, then you're a professional. And there's an art that they don't teach anymore. There's nobody out there mentoring, and that's the art of stroking. Nobody teaches these young cops how to stroke people. You know, you, you're going to – police work is very difficult. You're going to do what you got to do. It ruffles a lot of feathers. You're trying to do God's work to find that right guy, and you come across a couple of people that's not the guy, and nobody strokes them to send them away happy. You so know, I was, I, was talking, away happy. I was talking to my cousin, and, uh, you know, I'm half Dominican, and he grew up in Washington Heights, and – you know, he listens to the show. He's a big fan. He says he's learning a lot. What's up, Dwayne? And uh, he said that when he was a kid walking through Washington Heights, he'd get thrown up against the wall on a regular basis and patted down. And, uh, he's, you know, it's, it's something that stays with him to this day. And I said to him, I said, some people are better at doing this kind of work than others. And a lot of these units got expanded. A lot of people were running around in plain clothes, and they didn't have the gift that somebody who was an anti-crime had, somebody who was, I mean, a street crime had, somebody who had been working in anti-crime and deserved to be there 
you know, um, or they were there for a while. They weren't chasing 250s. And that's what it became. It became that chasing 250s. You had a lot of yeah. people just looking um, and, vi you know, just being aggressive, overly aggressive. You know, you know, you could tell it, the, the guys who are really good, they can tell if somebody has a gun. They can tell by the way they walk. They can tell by the, 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 the heaviness of their backpack. You know what I'm saying? There's a lot of uh, telltale signs there. You can't just go and throw people up against the wall and, and uh, you know, and hopefully nine out of ten guys, I'll get one. It's not the way it's not the way it was supposed to uh, to be. You know, when I was a kid, my, my father was a cop out in the village of Limburg on Long Island. And as a kid, I guess he knew I was going to grow up to be a cop just like him. But as a kid, he told me, Jimmy, you can always start out nice and then get nasty later. But yeah. if you start out nasty, you can never bring it back to being nice. Yeah, That's yeah. true. Yeah. Jim, I'm going to play a, a short video, and you probably recognize this. Uh, huh. You recognize this guy in the video, right? He's about 30 pounds heavier. <laughs> Buddy. Friends, and especially my family. Good afternoon, and welcome to the NYPD Aviation Unit. I first want to thank all of you for taking your time out of your busy days to be here to send me off. The assembly before me is quite humbling, as was the ovation which you just bestowed, bestowed upon me. I came on the job 31 years ago, January 1988. The funny thing is the other day while cleaning out my office, I removed the shoebox containing my old memo books. Inside of memo book number one, <laughs> scribbled on a back page was the salary breakdown for August 1988. After having just received a tremendous contract from then Mayor Ed Koch, where's Monaghan, Chris Monaghan, <laughs> consisting of 3% raises compounded over three years. <laughs> I would soon be earning $32,000 a year before any overtime. And boy, was I happy. <laughs> yeah. My only goal back then was to eventually work in plain clothes, chase and lock up bad guys, and one day become a detective. Well, I accomplished all of that and then some. But who knew it would lead to the most amazing career with the greatest department known to man, with some of the best cops ever created by God. You know, I came on this job from the United States Army where I was a lieutenant and thought I knew a thing about leadership. Although there are many parallels, leadership and policing presents a unique set of challenges and requirements. I was fortunate throughout my career to have some of the most magnificent commanding officers to coach, mentor, and share lessons with me, further developing me as a leader, as I added their input, lessons, and styles into my own growing leader repertoire. Some of them are no longer with us, but men such as John Dolan, Charlie Doonan, Bill Moranch, Andy Palmetti, Dick Savage, Al Matarasso, Mike Tiffany, Barry Galfano, Bruce Smoker, and even Jimmy O'Neill. Some of these men are still teaching me lessons. Some of them are here today. Most I have the I'm not going to let you talk forever. That was a pretty good speech, though. <laughs> I know you were like turning into Teddy Roosevelt there, but you know, <laughs> and I'm sure it was a, a humbling experience to, to uh, be able to give your own retirement speech. That was great. I mean, it, uh, was, a, it was a very special day. It yeah, was 100%. Hangar. Yeah, it was in the hangar. Yeah, it was in the yeah. hangar. Yeah, that's a, great, mean, that's a great send off. And Mark, do you know who his cousin is? No, uh, Pat, well, Pat, Ra Pat Ryder, Nassau County Police Commissioner. Oh, really? Yeah. yeah. He was a guest, a great guest, too, as well. Oh, Patty's yeah. great people. Yeah. It's amazing. Are you yeah. thinking about running for anything out there? In St. Raymond's Catholic School on uh, Atlantic Avenue in East Rockaway, I was in the first seat, and Patrick was right behind me, and those nuns would come over and smack him because he was always cutting up. And because you know, I'm his boy, and when she got done with him, she'd say, now you put your hand out. I'm like, but Sister Mary, I didn't do anything. She says, that's your friend, isn't it? Put your hand out. 
Uh-huh. So we took our, our beatings together. <laughs> you know, Jim, I don't know if you know him, but uh, he was another aviation guy, and I, I, I happen to love this guy, uh, Steve Bonanno. Oh, Steve was a great, great guy, and the yeah. real police. Yeah, and, but like such a, a humble, humble, nice, nice guy, you know? Good man. God bless him. He was a 4-6 cop. He had the combat cross. Yeah. Yeah. He was, you know, he did something in aviation that I thought was amazing. He landed the helicopter in a parking lot and chased a robber into a supermarket. <laughs> well, it's funny that you bring up the real police, street crime, happen to wind up in aviation. There's only two guys that have done that. <laughs> Steve Bonanno and me. <laughs> you landed a helicopter in a supermarket parking lot? So I'm a sergeant in aviation. Some savage tries to run down a Bronx narcotic sergeant. There's a pursuit. Of course, they keep calling it off. I keep switching to the next division, telling them there's a pursuit coming, and I keep it going. Um, Steve Silks, God rest his soul, was actually the, the duty inspector. Maybe the duty captain then. But the car goes into Westchester County. So I'm already up on the Westchester County's frequency, letting them know that, oh, it's been called off like five times. New York City has a pursuit coming. Long story short, the guy bails in New Rochelle by the train station, puts a gun on the front fender of front wheel of the car, and tries walking away. So we communicate to the New Rochelle police. They get the guy. I land, shut down. Me and the co-pilot get out, and we got the guy. Steve Silks shows up, and he says, hey, this was called off. I said, Really? I must have missed that. <laughs> and, but he was good. He got yeah, you're it. the old static. Shh, shh, shh. I'm a radio, now, right? I mean, having been formerly in Bronx Psychotics, I'm, I'm on my on the phone, like, you know, calling the FOD. Listen, what module was working in the 4-3 and, you know, had a, had a deal? Because we got the guy. So five minutes later, Bronx Narco shows up. The sergeant that they, that they tried to run over, he says, we got it. We're taking it. We wrapped it up with a nice bow on it. We st- we cleared out, started up, and took off. And went back like there was like there was nothing. And Steve would bring that up to me whenever he would see me. <laughs> and I told him, "What are we calling this off for? They they tried to kill one of us." Yeah, we, exactly. We don't stop. <laughs> That's incredible. Wow. Yeah. Tell so us. You, oh, go ahead, Mark. I'm sorry. I was going to say. I mean, five shootouts. Don't tell, tell us about. You know. I hate to say it this way, but, you know, tell us about the best one. (laughs) (laughs) I'll tell you the one that I feel the worst about. The dog. Oh, come on. (laughs) The dog shooting the poor pit bull on the search warrant. I'm working with Jimmy Gilday. We're hitting a building in in the 4-0, and they let a pit bull go with his, uh, his vocal cords removed. And he was just doing what he was supposed to do as a dog, his, his instinct. These guys were invading my house, and it still, to this day, breaks my heart. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Another ones, not so much. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. That's great. That's the way you should feel. Yeah, well, as long as it's all good, right? Because I'm sure you went through, you you go know, through hell when you get in the shooting, right? There, there was the... The second one, which was, you know, well, there, there was five, but three of them were, were mano y mano. The, the second one was a really bad dude and to this day sends shivers up my spine because it was right after Sean McDonald had gotten killed yeah. and had a, had a younger, less experienced cop encountered this guy, there would have been another funeral because this guy was a stone cold killer. Um, as it turns out, didn't work out so good for him that night that he came across two street crime guys. Um, but he had a bulletproof vest on and he had Teflon coated ammunition in a 357 revolver. Wow. He, he knew what he was going to do when he left his home or cave or whatever the fuck he lived in and, and went out that night. Um, and that, that one, that's the one that I, I think about because that would have been, it wasn't me, it was some younger cop. That would have been a dead cop. Yeah. There's really, and I try to tell people that, you know, it's all fun and games, but there really is evil people lurking out there that will do really evil shit to other people and the police 
It's it. A hundred percent. K Jack Images, thank you so much for the nine ninety nine super chat. I want to shout out to some of our buddies here: Bala Fitzpatrick, of course, Peter Pranzo, Boxing MMA, EDP. I love that one. Are you emotionally disturbed person? Twelve Step <laughs> Woman, Princess Mitch, Bala Fitzpatrick, MC's Audio, big fan of ours. Duty Ron, our biggest supporter. Thank you, Duty Ron, for all you do. Um, Ryan, Investigative Group, another street crime. I right? there should be a, like a street crime. Hollow like the Marine Corps, Hoorah, you know. Uh, Steve Kaczynski, Armando Rodriguez, um, Barry Galfano. Did I see that name? I thought I did. Uh, boxing MMA stream. Uh, who else? Jim Jamie, Jamie Pimatel, uh, uh, Costa, K Jack Tim Images, Timmy Acosta. Yes, Thomas Hover, Jim. Oh my god. <laughs> the, head of, the head of security at the Harvard Club. I'm coming in for lunch. If you can get Ray <laughs> Kelly out of there. Right? <laughs> Melody McAtee. Uh, we got a lot of fans in this uh, in the super, in the chat tonight. Thank you guys so much for supporting Police Off the Cuff. If you guys haven't seen our um, website, you got to see it. It's uh, policeoffthecuff.com. We got a lot of interesting stuff on there. If you're not a subscriber, please subscribe, hit the like bell, and give us, you know, 22 thumbs up if you can. Uh, Peter Pranzo, a bunch of street crime unit guys here tonight. That's right, Lieutenant Pranzo, and you were one of the deans of the street crime unit. Great to always have you here, Lou. Uh, forever he'll be called Lieutenant Pranzo, you know? Isn't that amazing? <laughs> well, you know, you, you brought up that street crime should have, like, its own war cry. It does. We own the night. Right, right. <laughs> that's that's true. We own the night. That's a, that's a great um, that's a great credo, a great motto, right? It's uh, but now you know something. They don't want units to have that personal pride, the camaraderie, the esprit How de corps. It? You know, and you know who suffers. I mean, it's not us. We don't suffer. It's like we said prior to the show. It's it's the poor people that live in those communities that are struggling every day to make a life for themselves and have to live behind wrought iron bars on their windows and seven locks on their doors. That's sad. Those are the people that suffer because of this political correctness and this defund the police bullshit. This doesn't really affect us. We go home to our homes and our, and our families in, in the suburbs. It's the people that we leave behind that depend on us. Those are the people that are going to suffer from this. And that really dis is disturbing. A hundred percent. You know, Mark, I think it's time for you to go to your um, your uh, commercial. Nice. I'm going to have to take you right to the, the hot sauce. <laughs> Listen up, guys and gals. We are sponsored by the best hot sauce in the world. Silk City Hot Sauce is made in small batches with pure ingredients. Locally grown peppers are the foundation of every bottle of Silk City Hot Sauce. There are several flavors from mild to wild, and you got to see the labels. Um, I use it every day. I uh, put it on. A, I'm on a diet right now. I lost 14 pounds. I'm feeling good. And uh, what keeps me going is I can I can spice up my food a little bit, give it some taste, and I use Silk City Hot Sauce to do that. So if you're like me, go to SilkCityHotSauce.com. And you put in the uh, coupon code OTC. OTC will get you 15% discount. So check that out. Folks, if you had it with New York, New York City, the suburbs, the high taxes, and you can't afford to go down to Jupiter, Florida, where Jim Cohn lives, <laughs> you can always go to Myrtle Beach, South Carolina. And Carol Waters is a realtor down there. She was a bartender at Fitzpatrick's Hotel in Manhattan for over 20 years. Her husband, Rob Mayen, was a uh, NYPD police officer who rolled over to the fire department. Right now, they're the kings of real estate down in Myrtle Beach, South Carolina, and they're doing really well. She's a million-dollar salesperson, so she really knows what she's talking about in regards to Myrtle Beach uh, real, real estate. So give her a call at 914-261-6681, or you can get her by email, Beach at gmail.com, and uh, you won't be sorry. Joe Murray is one of the biggest supporters of Police Off the Cuff podcast. The guy's unbelievable. He supports us both intellectually and monetarily. He sends us money all the time. You know, this, these lawyers got big bucks, but he's a very generous guy. 
He's now got a website, Joe at jmurray-law.com. If you get in any trouble, give Joe Murray a call. And here's a freebie. I'm doing this for um, the best candidate for Manhattan District Attorney. If you live in Manhattan, please vote for Elizabeth Crotty for Manhattan District Attorney. And please get out and vote. She's probably the only police-friendly candidate for Manhattan District Attorney. We're getting rid of Vance, another progressive left winger. Go back to Seattle, Cyrus. Please get back there quick. And let's get uh, Elizabeth Crotty elected and get someone in our corner for a change. Yeah, that Elizabeth Crotty, uh, that's, that seems to be uh, the election right there. Remember we had a guest on that was telling us that's the most, the most important uh, seat. Uh, it, besides for mayor, that's actually probably more important than Manhattan DA's office because they kind of sort of like dictate what's going on in the whole city, the way they're going to go. And once you get elected, you're there for a long time usually. <clears throat> yeah. I knew a guy who drove uh, Morgenthau, and he drove him for a long time. I mean, you know, it was that was his gig. Morgenthau was older than water. <laughs> yeah, he drove him for the last <laughs> 15 years of his reign, you know, and that was a big chunk of his detective time. You know, he was first grader for a long time. Lauren, Br Lauren Brem, yes, get out and vote in the primary. Uh, don't let that Wiley chick get the nomination. Primary is very important. You know, right now, I was talking to Jim Cohn before we went on the air, and right now it's uh, Eric Adams and the Sanitation Commissioner. I forget her name now. They're like running one and two. So with the new voting system, anyone could win this election. God forbid that Maya Wiley gets elected. She oh. wants to... She I wants to defund the police by three billion. You know. Are you talking about the one that had the private security? Yeah. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> it's crazy, man. Thank you. You're so lucky that uh, I saw a meme that said, uh, "Let's make America Florida." <laughs> <laughs> That's true. You're living in the best state in the country right now. Listen, this guy DeSantis, uh, my my governor goes, "I'm a Floridian now." Yeah. I retired in December. By January, I was a Floridian. DeSantis is amazing. Oh, he's brilliant. Cuomo is a clown. De Blasio is, is, is he's a punk. And it's sad what they did to a great state, the Empire State, and a great city. They destroyed it. Well, I would say, listen, you people from New York that are going to move down here to Florida, leave your liberal politics behind. <laughs> to Florida, be conservative like the rest of us. Nobody wants your bullshit. Stay there if you're going to bring bullshit. Well, that's the big fear. The big fear is that all these, uh, these, uh, well, the liberals, I think, are fleeing, not the lefties. So the liberals are fleeing, but you don't want them coming over there with the ideas that didn't work where they just left and, and bringing them over here now and destroy right, them. Exactly. So I don't think you have to worry about that too much in Florida. As a matter of fact, I think the whole country is on the turn. Right now, that uh, the critical race theory. Uh, half the countries against that. They're fighting. Uh, they don't want that in their education. Hey, Mark, yeah. The whole you know, thing is, um, you know, every one of these cities that talked about defunding the police, and now they were looking to refund the police. So I think the idea maybe was to get federal money the way we did back in uh, when I got hired, you know, uh, under that safe street, safe city. I guess if you let it go long enough, the, the feds will come in. They'll give you a certain amount of money, and then you can – that you have that extra money to put in all the other things that you want, uh, you know, to help. But I don't know where this money goes, by the way. Like, I really don't. I mean, I see homeless people on the street. They're not on their meds. They're punching people out of nowhere. Crazy. It's just, you know, it's just people that should be on their meds and should be somewhere. That's the, that's the thing. If, you know, when we were on the job, these people were going through the system, you know, whether they wanted to or not, and they would get some type of care. Well, are you on medicine? Yeah, I'm on schizophrenia. Med. Then they give it. They put them on it. They put the, the the thing of pills in their pocket. They send them on their way. Now they got meds for a month. Yeah, a whole bunch of psychos on the street, and they're not on their meds, and they're not getting. They're not going. Nobody's nobody's talking to them. They go through this. They get a DAT with a, with 150 collars under their belt. <laughs> it's nuts. You know, I wanted to ask you, Jim. One of the yes, things yes. too. In aviation, you guys have to fly around a lot of politicians, right? You have to shuffle them around like free rides here and free rides there. Couldn't you leave the door open and kick them out the side door or no? You know, th that was discussed. 
it was, it was, I'll be honest. <laughs> you know, so de Blasio, Big Bird, he really didn't fit in the helicopter. And then, like, he had, like, the whole entourage. And I was being told, well, you have to do this, you have to do that. And I'm like, listen, here's the deal. I only have X amount of helicopters are flying because, you know, one or two are in maintenance. We have to cover patrol. We have to cover air sea rescue, you know. God forbid, you know, not an EDP jumps in, but if a civilian goes in or if a cop tries to help the EDP, and now we have a cop in the water. So we're not taking those out of service. I only have one helicopter or two helicopters left because I'm not cutting out training. That's important. So the mayor gets to go, and, and the new helicopters that I bought were the uh, Bell 429, and we set them up for four people in the back in a really nice VIP interior. And I said, so the mayor gets to go with, you know, three other people. And then he gets four staff people can go in a second helicopter. And all these other lunatics that think that they're going to get flown somewhere, they can get on the bus. They're not flown. <laughs> Are you serious? They had more than eight people that wanted to go somewhere? So when this mayor took over, he had these young, skinny jean wearing progressives that – we're trying to dictate to us how we're going to operate. And they said, All right, so the mayor's going to this location, and then we have 15 other people that have to go with him. So I said, well, I got this kid on the phone. I said, let me tell you how this works. He's the mayor. So he gets to – it was national night out. So he gets a helicopter. There's three other seats in that helicopter. You figure out who's going with him. Then the police commissioner, he gets a helicopter, and there's – three open seats in that helicopter, and he'll figure it out. Outside of that, you need to figure out how soon in advance you and the rest of your cronies have to leave in vans <laughs> to where he's going to be because you're not going in a fucking helicopter. Good for you. Good for you. These uh, did, they, did they try to fight that? I had this guy tell me, We'll see where you're. We'll see where you're working. Come tomorrow, I said. You have this number. Call me here because I'll be here tomorrow. I don't know where you're going to be, but guaranteed, <laughs> I will still be here tomorrow. Uh -huh. <laughs> called, you should have called him a little Maytagger. He wouldn't even know. Oh, that meant. They were Val Fitzpatrick from Australia. Thank you so much for that twenty dollar <laughs> super chat. Wow, Australia is actually. They love uh, Inspector Jim in Australia. <laughs> oh, I love Australia. <laughs> oh my God. Lieutenant Peter Pranzo, Hall of Raiders. Roo, roo. Thank you for the five dollar super chat, Lieutenant. We own the night, Pete. That's right. You own the night. That's the you that's know. the that's a shout out. <laughs> Can you imagine if you didn't put your foot down what it would have been? You would have been driving these people from party like like you were a limo service, driving them from party to party all over the city. You know the private. It would have been crazy. They would have had you wearing a dress. <laughs> hey, you know if they if they're going to write the money on the check. You know, you're serving drinks on that flight, flying it and serving drinks. I have a buddy who's watching this right now, Bob Devine, businessman, but he used to be one of the owners in the China Club back in the day. And he'd be the first one to tell you that political correctness is not one of my fortes. <laughs> I, I, I have some things I'm good at, but political correctness and not pissing people off is not one of them. Well, that's you, good. You were the man for the job. Uh, it's, <laughs> see what they try to do? Do you see what they try to do? They wanted to make it like just fly them around, 20 of them, like with an entourage going from spot to spot. You know, it's just. I'm not a charter operation. I'm the police. This has nothing to do with police work. Uh -huh. You're not going. But that's going on in some cities. I know it is. It's sad. Yeah. Listen. I love how he said, see where you'll be working tomorrow. Oh, yeah. yeah I'll, be, I'll be right here. Oh, like I'm like I'm gonna cower to you. Okay, guy. Good luck. Yeah. <laughs> what size jeans are those? Thirty-two waist. <laughs> those are nice jeans. They make those for men too. You're gonna you're gonna say something to me. You better have at least a thirty-eight waist. <laughs> <laughs> Holy shit! That's great. So, uh, man, that was a, that's that's some career you had, man. God bless you. Uh, it was it was great. I like. If I had to do it all over again, I wouldn't change a thing. That's amazing. And now you're in Florida. I mean, it's like, I'm going to go down. And I'm definitely going to visit you because I swear to God, that's one of the places I want to move is Jupiter. 
No, I got room. Come on down. Yeah. No, I got room. Down here and go shop around. I mean, it's. I, I just want to see what you because everyone tells me how beautiful Jupiter is, and I want to check it out. Here's what it's like, Bill. It's like, it's like being home in New York, but the weather is better. <laughs> And the reason I say that is I walked into a restaurant called The Bistro a couple of years ago. And I said to the bartender, Bobby Shannon, who worked in Midtown, off the boat I was at, I said, do me a favor. Find out who the server is that has that table and give them a round of drinks with me. I knew the people from Long Beach. I said, but don't tell them it's from me. He says, okay, with his, with his broke. He comes back. He says, I took care of it, my man. And he puts uh, three shot glasses upturned, you know, in front of me. I said, I told you don't tell him it's for me. He says, I didn't. There's three other assholes in here just like you. <laughs> you all fucking know each other. <laughs> I counted at the end of it when I left there after a few cocktails. There were 18 people in that restaurant from Long Beach that, that I wound up knowing or knew people who knew. Wow. It's, there's a place called the Waterway. You go there on Friday afternoon, there's 40 people from Long Beach, from the Bluffs. They all like Long Beach people all go to the Bluffs. It's one neighborhood in Jupiter. Do they, and, do they let firemen come into that bar? And here, cops and firemen <laughs> get together. Cops and firemen actually are friends here in they Jupiter. They get along. Yeah, they get along in Florida, all right? The they, is behind they us. All that bullshit, all the ESU <laughs> bullshit behind them. Hey, we were here first. Yeah, Fuck oh, you know? no, nobody cares. Nobody gives a shit. <laughs> That's great. There are people that are attracted to the ocean. They have to be by the ocean. Their ideal life is by the ocean. I have a friend who lives in Long Beach, and, uh, you know, he's from Brooklyn. And he used to go to Rockaway Beach, you know, all summer. But something about the, the beach attracted him, so he moved to Long Beach. And he's been living there forever. And... Um, it's it's something about living by the beach. It, it's a different. You just you. I, I don't know. You breathe different. It's a different vibe. You gotta uh, be near the water. It's good for you. It's good for you. You know, I saw. You know, one of my favorite pastimes is in Florida, sitting by the intracoastal with a bottle of wine and just watching the boats go by. I'm so simple like that. You know, <laughs> just watching the boats. Phil, there's nothing wrong with that. I know. I, I love to see those boats that have the five three fifties on the back. I'm just like that guy. Oh, five four fifties. You never see that on Long Island, right? No, but you don't want to be the guy that has to put the gas in that boat. No, no way. Five four fifties, and it's like, oh my god. And and then I looked up one of those boats. They go for like two and a half million or three million. Some oh yeah. Boats. I see. Guys, they're not retired civil servants, I'm sure. <laughs> well, you, you never know. <laughs> you know did, did you see that? Did you see that meme that said? Uh, Everybody who owns a boat is a Trump supporter. And they responded, that's because um, you don't have the government doesn't give you boats. Doesn't give away free boats. How true! <laughs> don't give away free boats. You got to work for those. Mark, there's a lot of truth in that meme. <laughs> you got to work for those. <laughs> that's great. So you also worked in um, as a what a captain or deputy inspector. You were in the gun unit, right? So as a captain, I was in uh, – well, I made captain. Uh, I, I was in the intel division, probably the best secret in the job. Uh, in, intel was amazing. Uh, I made captain. <laughs> I got to tell the story. I'm in the captain's training, and Espo comes in, and he goes around the room. And I was in, in the first group off that list. I don't know. How, I, I must have got, got lucky. And I used my, my veterans points. You know, I never used them before. I used them then. So I made the first group. I think I was number 12. And some of the guys are still on the job, and they're, they're like chief of department today. So anyway, uh, they go around the room. Espo gets to me, and he's asking them how much time you have on a job, uh, 12 years, 13, 14, gets to me, and where'd you come from? I said, I got 19 years on, and I just left the intelligence division. He puts his head down, shakes his head. He goes, did you have the money? I said, no, but I was, you know, would have got it eventually. He goes, but you had a take-home car. I said, oh, yeah. He goes, you realize, as a precinct XO, you're not going to have a take-home car. I said, I know. He goes, I don't know. I think I would have stayed in the in the intel division. <laughs> he goes, you know, that's the best-kept secret on our job. I said, oh, I know. 
So anyway, I went to the 3-2. I was only there a short time. I got hijacked by Tony Izzo to narcotics. And I was in line to like, you know, they were looking at me too. Six months, we're going to get you a precinct. Um, I was like, great. And then all of a sudden, boom, I got hijacked. I go to narcotics. Steve Zolga had the group next to me. He had the Rockaways, so he had the 101. And I had the 103, the 113, and the, and the 105. So the 113 and the 103 were – heavy narcotics and the south end of the 105 but steve had a thriving business on the side so he said to me look you're single you got no life <laughs> you this job. no life or no wife <laughs> you got no no life no wife he goes i got a wife i got kids and i got a business i can't cover all these search warrants can you cover mine so i said yeah so i was covering my search warrants and his so when my name would come over the the pager or whatever we were using back then, it was Jimmy Cohn, Jimmy Cohn, Jimmy Cohn. So I look like a superstar. Uh, yeah, that's true. So Izzo taps me. They're going to reopen the firearms investigation unit, Brooklyn, Queens. That's where the guys, you know, James and James would, uh, when Vinny DiDonato had it, they got, they got assassinated. They shut it down after that. So now they're going to reopen it. So he put me in command. They transferred me to the Firearms Suppression Division, and I got Brooklyn Queens FIU. Joe Kenny had Manhattan Bronx. Joe now is the, I think he's the XO of the Detective Bureau. And then I had Brooklyn Queens, Staten Island. And uh, that's where Dan Davin was my lieutenant. I had a great time. I was there for three years. We bought a lot of guns. We did some great cases, some wiretaps. And it was, Mark, it was, it was comedy. Listening to what goes on in these wiretaps, <laughs> oh my god, it was it was hysterical. I should have wrote a book, but one morning we hit an apartment with a warrant, and the information was that the guy's a paraplegic because he was wounded in a, in, a, in a drug shootout. So now he's in a, a wheelchair, and he keeps his gun with him in a wheelchair. When he's in bed, he keeps it in the night table next to the bed. So we have information. We get the warrant based on this information. We're going to hit it, and we're going after the gun. Unbeknownst to us, he has a domestic with his girlfriend the night before, and she tells him, I'm going to flip you in for your gun to the police. He gives it to his buddy who lives upstairs. Hang on to my gun because she's a little hot, and if she does turn me in, I don't want the gun to be there. Well, we hit the place. We go in. He instinctively reaches to the night table. Thank God nobody shot him because uh -huh. the night table is empty. Now we wake up to Charlie Ida, the CI. Oh, yeah, you know, I got a little fucked up last night, and I was supposed to call you. Uh, yeah, he had a fight with his girlfriend, and the gun is upstairs in 2B. And I'm like, well, we don't have a search warrant for 2B, guys, so that does us no good. So we almost shoot an unarmed male black paraplegia. That's one. We go to the next buy. It's a deal set up about 9 in the morning. The undercover gets robbed. There's a clusterfuck. We wind up catching one of the guys, and then we catch what we thought was one of the guys. And as the undercover goes by, he goes, yeah, subject number one is one of the robbers. I don't know who the other guy is who's opened up and needs about 20 staples. Luckily, he was a bad guy, and he had bad product on him. So he's he's in. I'm like, okay, so now we almost shoot an unarmed quadriplegic. The undercover just gets robbed. And they were threatening to kill him. And we have a guy that's not even part of the mix who's on his way to the hospital for 20 staples. Thank God he was a criminal. Then they tell me at about 1030, I got a guy in the Bronx. He just called. He's a reliable guy. He's got six guns for sale, 2,000 each, but he'll discount it. 10,000, we can take all six guns. I'm like, I am not going back to the office to the safe to get 10,000, to give it to you, to walk <laughs> in with the undercover to a building in the Bronx to get robbed. They'll just assassinate him and take the 10 grand. You tell him, we'll buy one gun at a time throughout the day. With that, the phone rings at about 11.45. I'm like, yeah, Captain Cohen. And I think it's my cops fucking with me. Uh, yeah, this is, um, what was the guy's name? He's Kelly's chief of staff. Anyway. He's Mike, just, Mike Shea? No, no, this is, uh, he was Deputy Commissioner of Management Budget. Then he was Kelly's uh, Chief of Staff. Not Paul Brown, he was DCPI, the other guy. You know, some older Irish guy. Anyway, he says, um, 
you know, Commissioner Kelly would like you to be uh, the CEO of the Ace Unit. You know, you know, we interviewed some people. You're one of them. So I'm like, oh yeah, whatever. Like I'm like I'm being smart, thinking it's one of my guys. <laughs> so uh, he said, you know who you're speaking to? So I said, yeah. So I started calling him by what his first name, which I I can't remember right now. So he says, Captain, let me. I said to him, I asked him what his middle name was. Because I had the phone book and I, and I know. And he tells me, so I'm like, is this really you? He goes, well, who do you think it is? I said, look, you've been in the police department long enough. I mean, even as a civilian, you know how cops are. I'm thinking this is one of my cops that are like, you know, joking with me because we had a terrible morning. He goes, well, how terrible was your morning? So I tell him what I just told you guys. He goes, yeah, you should seriously think about taking this assignment. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, anyway, I took the assignment. I was transferred. That was on a Thursday. I shut the unit down on Friday. And Monday morning, I was a CEO of the aviation unit. And my stress level went way down. Wow. Went that's, down. A, that's an incredible story. And I mean, we would refer to a guy like you on this job. Your balls were dipped in butter, we'd say. <laughs> <laughs> I'd be honest. I don't know how I survived half the shit. Forget the street shit. Half the shit that I survived administratively within the job. Yeah. I was lucky. You get in five shootings. That's a, it's five different times. You don't know which way it's going to go. You know what, Mark? That was the easy part. Surviving the politics of the job was the hard part. For sure. For sure. That's unbelievable. <laughs> but, hey, you survived. Look, and uh, you're thriving now. I'm now, let me ask you something. When you get called to fly, how much advance notice do you get? Typically, it's like it's like a week or two in advance. There are some oh, so because you so you don't have to worry about going out and getting banged up and them say, "Hey, we need a pilot right away." <laughs> You'd be like, "Ah, I can't make it." No, I do my best work banged up. Yeah, yeah. I'm the only kidding. <laughs> <laughs> no, typically it's um, I mean these people, you know, they the schedules and they, they know they know what they're doing well in advance. Yeah, it's like gigs. You know, I, they book you. Okay, we're gonna yeah. we have a party on this day. We're gonna need to get there. Call up so and so. Exactly. Are you available on this date? And it's like a gig. I, I know right now my, my next 10 flights take me to the middle of July. I already have them in, in my calendar. Now there will be some surprise pop ups. You know, that's you know, that just happens. No, no, you work a lot. That's good. You work no, no, no. I have a rule. I'm retired. My max is ten days a month. Because after that, it might appear like a job, and I want nothing to do with having that's a job. Right. Wow. Well, that's right. That's a lot. That's a lot. You know, with, with that, uh, with all that money you got coming in. <laughs> no, no, Jim, go to the I'm on, a plane. I'm on a fixed salary. I'm on yeah. a you're on a fixed income. <laughs> yes. let, me, let me ask you something though. The the planes you're flying, they got to be like state of the art, best planes, right? Oh yeah, like the guy whose plane I flew today. Um, it's amazing. It's state of the art. It's all the newest technology and it's maintained very well yeah at, at this stage of the game i'm not getting into any old ship box and and flying around because my life is too important no that's wow. great you get that's to fly fantastic. when you get to fly and you're like it's like being a driver but every time you get into the car you're driving a bentley you know you're driving like a high-end performance car, whatever it is you're driving the top of the line car for somebody that's beautiful man that's the way you know it's like well she was gonna be an actress and I was going to learn to fly. Yeah. She took off for the footlights. I took off to find the sky. That could be your motto. <laughs> Harry Chapin, taxi. And then he was driving a taxi cab. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. You know, we're, we're coming up on, on an hour. I have to make a couple of uh, announcements. Uh, tomorrow, I'm actually doing a real crime episode with Joe Murray, who I just see in the, in the stream, and with um, Phil Grimaldi. A young girl from Westchester named Lauren Spear. It's the 10 year anniversary of her missing from Indiana University. Uh, June 3rd, 2011, she was reported missing and she's still missing 10 years later. We're gonna dissect that case tomorrow night with um, Phil Grimaldi, retired detective from intelligence division in the 6-0 squad and uh, attorney Joe Murray, who's a retired PO, but who's who got some amazing information on this case from his his attorney skills and uh, just say it's going to be a pretty damn good uh, episode tomorrow night of 
uh, real crime stories. Mark, you got anything? I'll be coming to you with a, I have a story that I did in my 20 and out. It's about commandeering a vehicle when I was a rookie. And if anybody, uh, you know, uh, subscribes to the Patreon, you know that I like to always add funny stories there. This is going to be another episode of uh, story time with Mark DeMeo about how I commandeered a vehicle when I was a rookie. That's great. After yeah. tonight, I'll be recording it. I just got to say one thing because I commented on the plane that, that I flew today. It was very nice. One of my best friends is a guy, Bob Devine, and he had an old Sabre liner, which is a military plane. Um, it wasn't my favorite to fly, but the thing performed like an animal, and he sold it. I'm happy he sold it. But it was a great plane. He now has a, a newer plane, which I happen to like, and I'm flying that. I happen to like it much nicer. Um, so I, I, I don't want to, you know, besmirch him. And, and, of course, my boy, Carlo Fognoli. Yeah, he was on our show. We love Carlo, man. <laughs> I'm sure he's watching tonight. Hi, Carlo. Carlo, Back how's tonight. it going, man? We're gonna stay away from Fort Lauderdale. I'm going to Jupiter, where the big coin is. <laughs> oh, he he wouldn't he wouldn't live down there. He wants to live up here too. He's smart. He's an animal. He's still out there doing it, putting I, his hands. You know, on he people. just got promoted to third degree black belt in jujitsu. That's some hell of an accomplishment. I wouldn't mess with him. No, and he's I mean, a marine. Hoorah. That's, wow. right. That's right. Joe Lisi, you know, Joe Lisi is as much as he's a uh, accomplished actor. He was a, a New York City police captain. He owns a restaurant. One of the number one things he lists in his life was being a Marine. That's I the thing him. he says. Joe is a good man. We yeah. were in, in the American Legion at the New York Athletic Club together. Oh my God. I could hear the war stories you guys would be telling after a few <laughs> cocktails. <laughs> It's amazing. You know, Jim, I want to just thank you so much for coming on the show. You were a little bit elusive. I don't know. I couldn't get a hold of you. You were in, you were in Steamboat Springs, Colorado. You are flying <laughs> over all over the place. But now that we got a hold of you, it was a, it was a great uh, great time to have you on the show. Yeah, I'm a big fan, my friend. <laughs> I'm so thankful that you guys, uh, you know, offered this to me. Um, it was an honor to be be on your show. And as you guys know, and I'm going to say something for everybody, I wouldn't change a thing. I loved the NYPD. I loved to tell people that I was the NYPD. It's a shame what's happening to it now. But I miss the clowns. I don't necessarily miss the circus. That's for sure. But the people that I worked with, the best people in the world, cops, deep down are the greatest and will do anything for you. And God bless them. And I I feel sorry for these kids today. I don't know if I could well, – I, I know. I couldn't do the job today. I'd be locked up. Yeah. And I, I really feel to the, these kids today. But I'm blessed to have had the career that I had and meet the people that, that I had the chance to meet. Jim, thank you so much. I just want to quickly thank Duty Ron for your 999 Super Chat. And, of course, Joe Murray, the great attorney. Thank you so much for all your support. Uh Kevin says, guys, hear what they, that lady say about taking, oh, yeah, Maya Wiley. She's out of her mind. She'll never be elected. So well, don't even worry about that lady. She's a nutcase, you know. And, oh, one other thing, people, folks, well, anyone that lives in Manhattan, please vote for Elizabeth Crotty for Manhattan District Attorney. She's the only one on the whole district attorney ticket. She happens to be a Democrat, but she's a middle-of-the-road, leaning right Democrat, and she's very police-friendly. We had her on our show, and she really wants to do the right thing. So if you live in Manhattan, please vote for Elizabeth Crotty uh, for district attorney. Get rid of these progressives. Mark, any last words? Well, yeah. Um, on June 19th, which is the Saturday coming up, I'm going to be at the Mayo Pack Inn with a uh, pretty cool lineup, man. It's uh, Greg uh, Cantone's show. And I'll, I'll probably be closing it out. But uh, if you're in, if you're up there north in Mayo Pack, I know we just did um, uh, Linsky's uh, retirement party up there. But, yeah, it's at uh, 927 South Lake Boulevard, Mayo Pack, New York. So if you're up there, come out Saturday night. By the way, Mark was great at, uh, at Linsky's retirement party. I hadn't been on stage for six months, so I sort of faked it a little bit. But I got a couple of laughs. But it was uh, – <laughs> if, if you haven't been on stage, it's a, it's a strange thing just getting up there out of nowhere, you know. Yeah, they, they put the uh, his wife Catherine put together some show for him, 
uh, some some night for him. There was how many people? There was a lot of people. Yeah, it seemed it like there was about two three hundred people there. Yeah, yeah, it was beautiful, beautiful, it was event. amazing. Yeah. And we were so, able and, to and Jim, I'm definitely coming to visit you in Florida. I'll give you a call, and we'll get well, Carlo Fognoli. We'll have a few cocktails. I have an extra room for you. You can have the guest room. It's all yours. You're the how about man. me? Could I? Get <laughs> You guys, should, you guys should snuggle together. Yeah, no, we no, can I'm do sick. a show. We can do a show on his deck. I'll come down, man. I'll come down. I got, come on man. down. I got some shoes like that. <laughs> <laughs> we'll go rock. We'll go uh, rock the house. That's yeah, right. that's right. <laughs> like the old days, we'll rock the house. <laughs> All right, man, we're at the hour, so uh, what can I say, man? We had another great episode tonight. Uh, thank you for all the people that were uh, involved in the chat tonight. Um, you know, Inspector James Cohen joined us tonight. He's got uh, some remarkable career. He's doing the thing right now, transporting drugs, uh, kilos of cocaine. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, you know, it's <laughs> not expected. New York every day. That's right. He's, he's, got, he's on that cartel route, you know? <laughs> Inspector James Cohn is now pilot James Cohn, and he's for hire. Here's his number. We're the eight hundred. No. Oh. <laughs> close it up, but you you close it up, man. Because like all keep... right, all you all you police off the cuff fans, thank you so much for supporting us. We're trying to bust out. We're at thirty six hundred, almost thirty seven hundred subscribers on YouTube. We got to get a, a week where we bust out and go over four thousand. Uh, we're trying. We're, we're trying really hard, and all you guys that are supporting us. We thank you so much. And Jim, again, you were a fantastic guest. Thanks for coming on. Yes, sir. Thanks, Thanks so much. God bless you. God bless. God bless. Good night, guys. Good night, everyone. Bye-bye.